Well, good morning to you. It's good to see you. Hope you are well. If you have your Bibles, John chapter 13. John chapter 13 is where we'll be. Uh, Love this place. This is a special place. Um, Not only did God uh, use it uh, in my dad's life, who's here today, he he was here many years ago, uh, trained theologically. Uh, He's been preaching for 45 plus years. Um, God used this place in my life where down on this particular place on my first day of chapel um, on my birthday, August 20th, 1996, God used his word um, to draw me and pull me and push me into a direction of vocational ministry. I was exploring, wasn't sure what God wanted to do, uh, and God used it. He also used that same text, my last day of chapel uh, as well. Uh, which was special. He used this place where uh, I haven't sung that song in this place, um, Great Is Thy Faithfulness. We sang that at our wedding where my wife and I were married right here in this chapel. And so this is a special, special place um, to my life, and I'm grateful to God. So here's what I want to do. Um, I want to walk us through um, a text and just really try to encourage us. I love sports, as Scott Mitchell, we've played a lot of games together. Um, we probably played a little bit too aggressive in the YMCA pickup, but you get a t-shirt when you win the championship. And 1 Corinthians 10 says, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it for the glory of God. That includes pickup basketball. That includes golf, which I played also in college. I love, and, and I just love sports. So I, I've enjoyed watching the journey to greatness. I've enjoyed watching um, men and women uh, excel, but in the two sports that I played and that I love, both Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods were, were amazing athletes. Uh, they've slowed down just a little bit, uh, but they were, I've had the joy of meeting both of them, uh, they, they were the GOAT. They are the GOAT. This is the language our culture uses, uh, the greatest of all all time. And yet, when you look at them as well as Tom Brady, they've all lost their marriages. The Last Dance, which was an amazing documentary on the Chicago Bulls, Michael couldn't get through the interviews without a glass of bourbon to his side. See, there's there's another goat, but we call him a lamb. He's not marked by status or scores, or Super Bowl rings. He's marked by one of the greatest acts of service, death on a cross. And the path to that cross was through, even in his final hours, serving. He, listen, he, Christ, redefined what greatness looks like. He redefined it. Look, it was not, it was not by accumulating trophies, it was with a towel and on a tree. That's how he redefined greatness. See, listen, listen, people in our post-Christian culture, they don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I believe, I'm convinced, doing ministry for 28 years in a city that's thriving, the number two city in the world to live, one study showed for the quality of life. I think we've got to build bridges to this generation and the generations that are coming, not only to be a people moved by deep convictions around theological truth, but mighty acts of service and hospitality, gratitude, generosity. Listen, Michael Frost, an author, wrote a book called Surprise the World, Five Habits of Highly Missional People. And he quotes, he quotes the fourth century Roman emperor Julian who said, those Christians began with their hospitality and service of tables. And the result have led many, they have led many into atheism. What's he saying? What's he saying there is that Christianity in the Roman Empire was the one religion that 
was called, those Christians were called atheists because they didn't believe in all the Roman gods. And yet, the way they lived, they were winning people to Christ. He would go on, the emperor, and he would be so concerned <clears throat> over these Christian acts of hospitality and service and how they were winning so many to Christ that he launched an offense against them by mobilizing his officials and the pagan priesthood to outlove the Christians. And it failed miserably. So what? what? What if we as followers of Christ were marked? What if we were marked not by an arrogance, but an aroma, an aroma of service? See, listen, listen, looking and leaning into serving, right? It empties you of yourself. You are, listen, <clears throat> you are never more empty than when you are full of yourself. May God raise up a generation, listen, that loves him and looks like him. And so I want to I wanna show us three simple truths this morning from John 13. And here's the temptation. Here's, here's the temptation from the prof that's been here the longest to the student This is the first time on campus. These settings, this journey, you're going to maybe embark on, that you are on, the temptation in this season of your life is to grow way too familiar with divine things. Don't grow too familiar. With holy things. Please, don't, don't take this for granted. <clears throat> this place, it's a gift of grace from God. Please don't take it for granted. I was with two former atheists two weeks ago at a Christian college. They grew up in a communist country, and they just wept the entire day. They didn't know universities existed where you could worship and get a degree. They just wept for two days. So listen, may God help us. Let me pray. Father, help us. Teach us. God, help us. As we lean into this word, would you lean into us? Teach us, God. Please, please help us. Please open our eyes. Please help solidify what it looks like to follow you and to represent you and to share you. God, please do a work. <clears throat> we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. John 13, look at it. Here's what's happening. It's an incredible text. In John from 13 to the end of the chapter, the, the narrative of the text slows way down. Uh, it's moving fast from chapters 1 to 12 and chapter 13. We come to the feast of the Passover, verse 1 says. And Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, listen, listen to verse 3 here, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. Now, here's the first truth this morning. Followers of Jesus ponder His acts of service. Po followers of Jesus, they, they ponder His acts of service. So, what's happening? It's the, it's the Passover. Familiar with this? They're, they're celebrating this, and Jesus is there. And, and this, this Passover, Last Supper as we would know it, uh, this is where he, he would implement the Lord's Supper as we know it and celebrate His 
deliverance from sin, where they were celebrating the deliverance of God from the bondage of slavery, Egypt. And so he's here, and think with me, that's three years of ministry, it's the last hours, arrest is coming, a cross is awaiting, God's righteous wrath will be poured out on the most righteous man who has ever lived. And he loved them. He loved them to the end of his life. And listen, he will love you to the end of your life. He is a faithful Savior. And verse 3, notice just Christ, Christ the sovereign one. He is, he is willing to serve and suffer in the way he's going to because he knows, because he knows that the Father has sent him. And he works all things together for the good. Oh, he, he worked even in my life in college, which was a mess, and chasing my identity and idolatry in sports. I joined a fraternity, I'll never forget. I was hazed in the fraternity, and I was hazed to the point to where you had to light a match and turn it upside down before it would burn your hand and say the Greek alphabet. I learned the Greek alphabet rapidly, and I'm like, when I transitioned out of that and started walking with Christ, like, God, how would you ever use those years? And of course, the first class I took at Southeastern was Greek. My first quiz at this school was the alphabet. And trust me, I got an A in Greek, a C in English in college, but an A in Greek. <laughs> Praise be to God. He works all things together for good. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to lean in with me because I'm going to drop it down in fourth or fifth gear, and, and we're going to do a unique work with the Word this morning because before I land on verse 4, I want you to feel verse 4. I, I want the effects of verse 4 to land on you like a pile of bricks. And so here's, here's what I want to do. Before we unpack it, I want you to notice a few things. I want you to notice that in, in Mark 9, Matthew 18, and Luke 9, these, these three gospel writers have, Jesus has oftentimes engaged with his disciples in unique ways regarding, regarding greatness. It's fascinating. When you look at all of these texts, they all are a summary of the transfiguration, which is amazing, amazing things happen there. The, the next day, the text says, um, demons uh, are cast out. Um, and then he foretells of his arrest, death, and resurrection. And all three times, right, is recorded. An argument breaks out among them. An argument. I mean, he's, he, the transfiguration, he's, his power, throwing out a demon, and, and then an, an He's foretelling, hey, guys, this is what's going to happen. This is what's coming to me. I'm going to be arrested, death, resurrection. And then they, in the background, began to whisper to one another, who's the greatest among themselves? I mean, listen, in Matthew 18, he would, he would, he would lean in and say, well, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom. In Mark 9, he would say, after all of this, and I think he's responding to their argument, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Luke 9, he says, listen, <clears throat> for, for he who is least among you will be the one who is great. Listen, Matthew 20. In Matthew 20, there's, it's the third time in Matthew that he's telling about his death. He's oftentimes walking with his disciples, and he's telling them that this is what's going to happen. I'm going to be arrested, crucified, buried. I'm going to rise. And in Matthew 20, mom even gets involved, right? It's like the middle school team when they don't get any playing time, and mom starts complaining uh, to the coach, mom gets involved. The mother of the sons of Zebedee come up and with her sons kneeling beside him and ask, hey, say to these two sons who are mine to sit, one at your right hand, one at your left in your kingdom. And Jesus says, you don't have any idea what you're asking. 
He would respond, in that situation, whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, listen, I want you to feel the tension. I want you to feel the tension. In Luke 22, in his account of the Last Supper, something unbelievable takes place. In Luke's account of the Last Supper, he doesn't record the washing of the feet. In Luke, Luke 20, he doesn't record the washing of the feet. From his perspective, what he's leaning into, and the Spirit led him to write, is in verse 19, this amazing, amazing text about the, the cup and the bread. And this is what it means. And then at the supper, at the last supper, at the, at the hours before the king of the universe is arrested and crucified, Luke 22, 24 says, a dispute also arose among them. They're at the supper. A, a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. Like you, you could lean in and say the greatest probably argument through, throughout the, the, the text of the disciples was not how they could serve, but how they could be served. And it's even at the Last Supper, they still don't get it. I mean, they're, listen, listen, they're fighting not over, right, not over a towel, they're fighting over a title. They want to be recognized. And some scholars believe that Jesus' reaction to the argument that's not recorded in John but recorded in Luke is that he overheard them. Yes, speculation, I acknowledge that. But verse 4 says he rose from supper. Did, did he hear them arguing once again and one more time? L let, me, let me show them, even in this hour, what greatness looks like. He rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel. They've seen so much. He's done so much. Miracle after miracle. Speaking life, resurrecting life, the king of the universe on his last night. He picks a towel up. What in the world? What is this? Listen, the, the path, uh, the path to the cross was through the nastiness of dirty feet and greedy hearts. See, listen, 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 listen. The point of cleaning dirty feet was that he would make a way for our dirty hearts to be clean. He was blazing a trail to a hill where he would show what ultimate servanthood would look like. Now listen, listen to me real quick. So messed up this morning, I'm so sorry. Listen, I spent a little bit longer on this first point, then we're going to land the plane. I, the, the only fuel and resource 
to sustain you to live a life of service is to ponder how much you have been served by the Savior, not in the washing of your feet, in the cleansing of sin from your heart. He didn't take a towel and basin. He took a tree and bore the full cup, the full cup of God's wrath for our sin. This is the gospel, the good news. It saves us Right from the wrath of God, what Christ has done when you believe on Him and trust Him and place your faith in Him. And it sustains. This gospel both saves and sustains. It's me reflecting on Him, what He's done that sustains and strengthens me to continue to serve, to continue to lean in. Listen, listen. When you ponder his acts of service towards you, you will will give your life away in serving. He will, listen, guard your heart. Guard your heart in these days. Don't wait to to get out of school to start serving. Ponder, Ponder the Savior's service towards you. It will be a source of strength all of your days. So listen, followers, followers of Jesus, what do they do? They, they ponder his, his acts of service. The most remarkable, remarkable act of service was the cross, but his path to that was washing dirty feet on his last night. But they also prepare. They also prepare for a life of service. Notice in verse 12 and 13, he says, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments, he resumed his place. He says, do you understand what I have done to you. You call me teacher and Lord. You are right, for so I am. So what is he doing here? Right? He's the hero at the table. He's, he's, he's trying to, to redefine greatness. Now, what's fascinating about the text is he doesn't rebuke the desire to be great. He's not rebuking them for the desire to be great. He, he's 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 redefining the idea of what greatness looks like. And what, what, what greatness is all about is it's not where you sit, it's how you serve. Now, listen, some pastoral counseling really quick. Listen, don't, don't, don't go through ministry and life wherever God leads you. Don't, don't grab for the high chair because it always leads to grumbling if you don't get it. And if you do get it, it never satisfies because you had to take it rather than it being given to you. And the gospel, the gospel frees you to grab the low chair and be content sitting there. And when the higher chair is given to you, you see it as a gift and it leads to gratitude. But if you're always grabbing for the places of honor, grumbling comes out of your mouth more than gospel conversations will ever because you're consumed with yourself. See, William Lane says it like this, the reversal of all human ideas of greatness and rank was achieved when Jesus came not to be served but to serve. Listen, we're consumed, are we not? We're, not, we're, we're all consumed. I'm consumed. You are, we're all are consumed with self. The photo, right? Like the photo, the family photo, the Christmas photo, whatever. Where do your eyes start floating, right? They, 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 the eyes find yourself in the picture because you want to see how good you look. See how, how was that? Good hair day, bad hair day, right? This, this is the way. I mean, growing up in Southern Virginia, we used to run outside and we would always shout this word. We would shout shotgun, not like we used to shoot shotguns back then, but we would shout shotgun because we wanted the place of honor. We wanted the front seat. Nobody ran out, all my boys. We didn't run out and say, back seat, let, let me get it. What? What? What's wrong with you? No, 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 no. Right? Think, think about this, some of the fruit of this love of self and being served. It, it, it can be seen in multiple ways, but one of the largest is in the number of selfies that are taken every single day. Think about this for just a minute, right? And if you take selfies today in your own campus, praise God. So, 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 but, but here's the deal. Here's the deal, right? In, in the word selfie was, was, was recently added to the Oxford Dictionary in 2013, 
So it wasn't even a word. <laughs> Think about that. 90 million, 93 million selfies a day are taken. <laughs> so <laughs> unbelievable. So, so one journal of family medicine found, watch this, stay with me, found that 259 people worldwide died in selfie-related accidents between 2011 and 17 compared to just 50 people killed by sharks. You say, what? So so what what do they do? Well, they go to the Grand Canyon, and they think the Grand Canyon needs your picture in it to make it look better, right? So they, they try to get as close to the edge as they can with a stick and leaning, right, to get a selfie with a waterfall in the back, and their foot slips, and they died. More, more people have died, this, this, this from a, med, a journal of family medicine, have died from taking selfies than being bit by a shark. So it's safer, let's go this route, it's safer to swim with the sharks than to take a selfie. How about that? Right? Right? Narcissistic culture we are? Listen, listen, listen. The world, the world says greatness is defined by status But the word says, and Jesus says, greatness is found in serving, in serving. And so listen, let's let's continue to stay in this book and read this book and have this book read us to cultivate, to cultivate, right, a heart to serve. And so followers of Jesus, what do they do? They ponder his acts. He rose and picked the towel up. Right? They prepare for a life of service. It's not just, I want to go serve. I want to be a servant. And third is this, and last, we'll land it. Followers of Jesus practice daily acts of serving. They practice it. Now, it's fascinating what he does in 14 through 17. Jesus, he says, if I then, Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to do in the same way, for I have given you the example. Now, the example came, remember, the example came in a heated debate of who's the greatest on his last night as he's taking the Passover and saying, this is actually about me, I'm the Passover lamb. He says, now, I've given you the example. This is how you should do. There's a plea from the Lord to his followers, even the way he does it. If I, the Lord, reasoning from the greater to the lesser, if if I, the teacher, have done this, you see what he does there? Lord, teacher, master, he even says in 16. If if I, in in verse 16, the master, if, if I've served, shouldn't you, the student, the one sent, the one saved by my blood, shouldn't you who are Less than I, but he's showing who's the greatest, the most elevated person in the universe, who upholds the world by the power of his word, is washing dirty feet on his last night on earth. It's remarkable. So God, God help us, right? God help us in our churches never to ask from others anything we would not be willing to do for ourselves. I love men who serve in this way like Truett Cathy, True, Kathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A, uh, maybe you, you know about it, maybe you don't, but he served for 60 years teaching Sunday school to eighth grade boys, <laughs> making some good chicken. The filet sauce, I could drink it with a straw. It's unbelievable, right? Just serving, not telling anybody, just serving. Philippians 2 says it like this, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, Count others more significant than yourselves. Look each of you. Look not only to the interests of others, but also to the, look not only to his own interests, but the interests of others. Have this mind, have this mindset among yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus. And then unbelievable text from 5 through 11, it says he took on the very nature of a servant and even died a death that we deserve. So listen, in closing, in closing, think about this. This, this self-forgetfulness is, is, is hard in this culture when everything centers around I, right? It's I Mac, I phone, I, I this, I that. Think, think about this. Think, think, Tim Keller helps us 
in his book, Freedom of Self-Forgiveness. It's a short read, but it's a great read. And the point of it is this. It's, it's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And God, would God do this work in us to be a people marked by this? How does this look practically? Right? What does this look like practically? I think it looks like this. I think it looks like every day you, you're waking up, you're asking God, hey, Lord, help me to leverage my life today for the kingdom of God, for the good of others, everywhere I go. And how can I, how can I look for practical ways to serve even today? Just, just, I mean, from the simple things. I, my wife and I have been married 26 years, married right here at this platform. And in our first year of marriage, what we leaned into was we were going to try to outserve each other. And what that meant was this. It meant that as we, as we were in that first year of marriage, realizing we were really different, um, we, we, we were counseled, and it was great counsel, to every time you felt inclined to, to pray for your spouse to be changed, you would go in a separate room and volunteer yourself to be changed. First year of marriage. Because I, mean, I had a list of some things that needed to change. And she had a list of some things that needed to change. And what we did, instead of praying that for the other person, we just volunteered ourselves to be changed over and over and over. And what it did, it began to melt our hearts to the point that where we were trying to outserve each other. Even to the point, on this particular day, coming home from work, I walk into the grocery store knowing that we need some milk in the, in the fridge. We were out, and as I walked in, I was just accustomed, right? I was accustomed. Mom and Dad raised me this way. This is the way we do it. So as I, as I walked in, I, I just naturally was reaching for the milk with the red cap. It's the real stuff. It's the thick stuff. Right? The rig, it's the full body, the good stuff, right? So as I'm going to reach for it, so, so the Spirit of God begins to talk to me in Harris Teeter, and but not audibly, but, but he says, he said, man, this is a great opportunity to take the low place and grab the light blue cap milk that your wife likes. And I'm like, but Lord, I'm having a conversation with the Lord. In, in, in the grocery store, I'm like, Lord, this, this, is, this is water with white food coloring in it. There's no substance in it. It's less calories, but it's nasty. And those, so I tried to reach again for the red cap, and the Spirit's like, why don't you out serve and grab the blue cap on this day? And so I'm looking around. Has anybody seen me? I'm having a debate over which milk to grab. And so I, I, I grab the light blue, first time ever in my life. <laughs> and I go, I check out. I arrive home, and I walk in. I'm, I'm, and I, I, my wife walks in. I'm like, sweetie, what's up? Hug, kiss. I'm like, I got to tell you something. You, you just won't believe what happened. Now I'm going to boast of what I did, right? So, so she's like, well, I wanted to tell you something. And I'm like, well, you go first. I want to outserve you, right? So she goes, well, I was coming home, and I stopped at the grocery store on the other side of town. And when I went in, I, I knew we were out of milk. <laughs> like the Spirit of God is working in two different grocery stores at the same time. And she says, she says, I know how much you love the real stuff, <laughs> the red cap. And so I got, I got you some. I go, no, you didn't. You won't believe what happened when I was at the other grocery store. And, and God, it, it was, it's, it's milk, right? But, but God said, this, this is it. Every day. Every day. Out serve. And 17 Verse 17 says, if, if, you, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. You don't serve to get blessed, but sometimes you might get blessed. Because that night, I had whole milk. <laughs> and it was really good. But I was willing to give it up for the greater good of somebody else that I loved. And ultimately, wanted to honor him. And so, listen, as you set the trajectory for your life, especially at a young age, everything in this world says to grab the high chair Go for it. Listen, keep grabbing a towel. It'll serve you well. Your heart will be completely satisfied in what he has done for you in all that you cannot do for yourself. He's a great savior. He's a king. He washes feet and he cleanses hearts when you trust him.
So let me pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thanks for the opportunity to just share your word. And God, I do pray for all of us, myself included, that we never get over the gospel, we never get past it, that you would move us deeper into it, that you would continue, God, um, to strengthen, continue to strengthen our resolve to follow you, that we would follow you, and we would ponder these things that you have done for us that we could not do for ourselves, that you would help us to, to prepare for a life of service, God, not to be served, but to serve, just completely giving our life away to service. And that, God, you, you would open our eyes and, and show us, so you would take our eyes off of ourselves, and that you would move our eyes to those that are in need. So do this work, we pray. We worship you now in Jesus' name. Amen.